This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 92 was recorded on December 7th, 2017. I'm Eric Townsend. Natural resources investor Marin Katusa will be joining me as this week's feature interview guest. Marin and I will discuss the corruption crackdown in Saudi Arabia and what it means for oil markets, the OPEC cut extension, the Saudi Aramco IPO, electric cars, nuclear power, and much more. Bitcoin is racing to nosebleed high levels this week, so we're going to dedicate much of our post-game segment after the feature interview to the subject of Bitcoin. But first, we're going to finish our conversation from last week focusing on the short vol trade. And I'm Patrick Ceresda. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 after that tax reform gaps to an all-time new high and then gives it all back uh, with further distribution throughout this week. Is that it? I mean, was that sort of like the moment where the market just reached its point or do you think it's still going higher? Clearly what happened there was the, the reaction was, you know, the, this news report was discredited over the weekend. Uh, President Trump's not really going to be impeached after all. Uh, a lot of people were probably as many disappointed by that as there were relieved by that. But the market definitely uh, took relief in it. And I don't know if that's a high. It seems to me like every time we felt like, oh, surely this has to be it. We just march higher. So I, I don't think we've seen a enough of a parabolic rise. It was, you know, pretty steep there for a little bit, but nothing on the scale of, say, you know, the, the way the end felt, say, 2000 or other events that have led up to a big price crash or reversal. So I suspect there's probably more upside from here, but I'm sticking to my story, which has been, if you must chase the upside that's left in this market, do it with options, because we're definitely in the late stages of something here. Whether it's over, we have a few months left to go, I don't know. I don't think anybody does. All right. Well, let's move on to that U.S. dollar index, because really over the last few days, we've finally seen a little bit of life in the dollar index as we've seen it strengthen uh, to almost to the 94 handle on the upside. Do you think that this is now a legitimate place where the dollar index could have reversed? Well, you know, it's fascinating to me because definitely it's looked much stronger in the last couple of days. I was surprised, though, when we saw that breakout that seemed very decisive through the inverse head and shoulders pattern. I thought it was headed to 97 from there, and then it kind of rolled over, and then it looked like it was going down. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we're still treading water, but it's uh, definitely jury still out. I was starting to be persuaded that, boy, the tape looked awfully weak a, a week or two ago. Now it seems like the strength is back there. Uh, I guess what's really surprising to me, Patrick, is I would have thought that once the Fed chair nomination was known, that a trend would emerge in one direction or the other. And we're really not seeing that yet. So I'm fascinated to see what comes next. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil because now the OPEC meetings are rearview mirror and we suddenly see the momentum that oil had to the upside really start to calm down here. Do you think that's the top for the crude oil market? Patrick, let's start with inventory. Crude oil drawing down 5.6 million barrels nationally, 2.75 million barrels drawn down at Cushing, Oklahoma. Now, that's a really big drawdown for Cushing, Oklahoma. Keep in mind, though, that that's not the beginning of a new trend. It's not like that's the way things are going to be from now on. It's a direct result of the spill on the Keystone Pipeline. There are repairs being made. TransCanada has cut back 85% of deliveries from Canada to Cushing through the pipeline. As soon as that's fixed, we're going to see an end to these really big Cushing drawdowns. So you would think these drawdowns in crude oil should have been bullish for oil prices. The thing is, they were more than offset by a massive build of 6.8 million barrels of gasoline. And distillates also building 1.7 million barrels. Now, that 6.8 million barrels against analyst expectations, which were for much, much lower numbers, you would think that would have immediately jerked the market much lower because that build on product inventories definitely dwarfs 
the smaller drawdown in crude oil inventories. Actually, what we saw in reaction to the numbers was a quick move to the upside. I think the reason for that was a sigh of relief, which was that API on Tuesday afternoon had actually reported an even bigger gasoline build of more than 9 million barrels. So when it was only 6.8 million barrels, there was a quick sigh of relief, a little bit of upside movement on the oil price. And then as soon as the reality sunk in that, hey, 6.8 million barrels is still a massive build, we saw it roll back over to the downside. Meanwhile, production also up to a new record, 9.707 million barrels. Rig count up in the last two weeks. So we're definitely seeing, I, I think, the prediction that I made last week coming true, which is that the OPEC meeting was probably a sell the news event with prices moving higher. The front of the curve has moved back into a slight contango as that panic over the Keystone pipeline spill has faded. By yesterday's close, yesterday's close, that's Wednesday's close, it seemed really clear to me that the uh, call that I had made saying this is a sell the news event and that a new downtrend was in play seemed to have been playing out. Hey, finally, I was right about something with respect to the oil market. The thing, though, is although at first I would have said today's bounce was really just par for the course. You know, anytime you have a big down day, it's not surprising that the next day is a bounce. If I look at the action in West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil was what, maybe a 50% retracement of yesterday's action and uh, started rolling back over and selling off after the pit close, has all the looks of a dead cat bounce with a downtrend set to resume. With one really big caveat, and, and I do say big caveat, which is our Bob Gasoline tends to lead the crude oil contracts. It definitely led the charge lower yesterday. And uh, our Bob actually closed above its five-day moving average at about one spot. 70. The moving average, the five day moving average was at one spot 6958, and we closed up around one spot 70. So, nicely above that five day moving average, that kind of almost looks like gasoline is telling us that it's time to continue with the uptrend. And maybe the downdraft that I thought was going to last much longer is over already. Now, crude oil is not signaling that it's over, but I'm watching gasoline carefully. It needs to roll over and get back below the five-day moving average, or else I'm going to start to get concerned that it's going to lead the crudes higher. All other indications that I can see, though, suggest that a sell-off is going to continue. Big question, though, is a sell-off how far? The 55-day moving average would probably be the next obvious target, around 54 uh, and a half or so. The next obvious target lower would probably be the 55-day moving average at 54 spot 32. We need to see a uh, close below 50 56 first, which is where the 34-day moving average was. That's what we bounced off of yesterday. We need to take that number out with a close below the 34-day, right around $56. And if that happens, it green lights that move down to the 55-day. Again, I think that that's kind of what's in the cards, except for this contrary indication from gasoline. So I'm going to be watching gasoline carefully over the next couple of days and see what happens. Now, Eric, let's talk gold, because what a big move there was in gold today. Uh, I mean, we definitely broke all of the key lows, and we're now trading below 1250 on uh, spot. What's your thinking here on gold? Well, taking out 1260 decisively, as we discussed last week on the program, I think that was the, the key level. As soon as that broke, the move to the downside continued. I don't know exactly where the technical support levels are. I want to ask you that, actually, but I, I think that it's probably just above 1200 at this point. Something I think is definitely playing a role here is Bitcoin is really emerging as a competitor to gold. Now, don't get me wrong, folks. I think the idea... If you look at the job that gold is supposed to serve in a portfolio, which is a hedge against really bad, you know, world coming to an end kind of risk, failure of the financial system, the, the notion that anybody thinks Bitcoin is a better alternative than gold for that purpose blows my mind. I think that's silly. But, you know, they don't listen to me. A lot of people think that. And I think that what we're seeing is that as a disaster hedge, a lot of people are starting to look to Bitcoin rather than gold. And so it has a new competitor. And I think that 
that's going to continue to present a headwind, especially as we see crazy days like today in the Bitcoin market. Even though it is not rational and does not make sense to look at the price of something like Bitcoin going up when there, dramatically when there is no change in the fundamentals, a lot of people think that that's justification. It proves the bull argument for Bitcoin. It's time to jump in with both feet on Bitcoin. I think that's crazy. But again, it doesn't matter what I think. I think a lot of what's happening to gold is it's losing its market to people that are making what I think is the wrong decision about using Bitcoin instead of gold in their portfolio. As far as what would be a salvation for the gold longs, if we saw a decisive breakdown in the U.S. dollar index below 91, well, that would definitely be a tailwind for gold and maybe we'd move back up to that key resistance around 1300. But we're not seeing that. We're seeing the opposite. The thing that occurs to me, though, Patrick, you know, I think we almost glossed over it. I'm not sure it was last week or the week before, but you said you were seeing things in the silver market that you thought could be a precursor of a move lower in gold. Well, we certainly got the move lower in gold. So please tell our listeners, what were you talking about? I know this is something you discussed with your big picture trading clients a couple of weeks ago. What was the signal that you saw in silver? What was it telling you? And what do you see in terms of technical support levels on gold here? The one thing with silver, it was just a, a key technical break. So gold was just trading in its range, and silver was uh, trading, you know, Tuesday of last week around the seventeen dollar mark. And then suddenly, through Tuesday and Wednesday, we got a huge breakdown in silver down below sixteen fifty. Just this huge breakdown below all these key support levels, and gold didn't budge on that. And you know, sometimes you know, silver behaves often like the cousin to gold, and they tend to move lockstep correlation. And so the the fact that silver was giving this signal and gold didn't react, it was an interesting exercise to see whether it was kind of leading the eventual gold break. And, you know, so now silver's been selling pretty hard all the way down to like 1575 for the last week. And finally, gold just succumbed to that. We saw this huge breakdown below this kind of 1265, 1270 on gold, where all the major lows were coming in over the last month or two throughout October and November. Nonetheless, with this breakdown in gold, at this stage, you just do technical measured moves. And so at this stage, the weakness, the doors open for gold to go all the way down, finish a measured move to about 1220. But you want to note that this year, gold made major lows in March around the 1200 mark, in May around 1220, and in July around 1210. So with the measured moves coming down into there, it looks really like gold is going to go and test that area. And that's where we're going to see whether the support lines hold. I agree with you. And I think that the question about whether whether the support lines hold will probably hinge on two issues. Number one, what happens to the dollar index? If we see a decisive move below 91 or above 97, gold's probably going to be affected in the opposite direction from the dollar. The other is, I think we've got to continue watching this mania in Bitcoin. We should probably save that for the postgame segment after the interview with Marin Katusa. Absolutely. So let's move on and have a quick look at those U.S. Treasury bonds. What's interesting to me is like we always look at that 10-year Treasury yield, and that's what we're going to look at. But it's interesting to see the yield curve flattener still working full throttle. I mean, the 30-year continues to outperform the 10-year bonds. And so, you know, that we look at this 10-year yield trading around 236, and it's really been range-bound, but it doesn't really tell the whole story of the curve. Anyway, what's your thinking here on interest rates? You know, I, I, I feel ashamed. I don't really have a whole lot of new thinking. And as I've said in the last couple of weeks, I'm really surprised, not by what has happened, but by what hasn't happened. We're, we're right around the same levels as we were before the Fed chair nomination was in. I was thinking this market was waiting for an indication of who's going to be at the helm on the Fed, and that would set a trend in motion. And, you know, this is not a trend. We've seen, what, five or six basis point moves in a week. That's not a big deal. Definitely. Definitely, yield curve is suggesting that the uh, economy maybe is not looking great, but I don't see in terms of absolute levels in the 10-year any clear trend here, and I'm surprised that we don't have one. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. For this week's featured interview, noted natural resource investor Marin Katusa will be joining us. Eric's interview with Marin is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next is Marin Katusa.
Katusa, founder of Katusa Research and a very well-known natural resource investor. Marin, I want to start with not just the oil market, particularly Saudi Arabia. You know, I absolutely do not profess to be an expert on Saudi Arabia and their culture and uh, politics and so forth. But what little I thought I knew about that country is I thought they were a very conservative culture that tended to place a lot of value on things like age and experience, you know, older age, wisdom. You, you would think in a culture like that, that if there was going to be a procession of power, according to bloodlines, it would probably go to the king's eldest son. And the other impression I've had of Saudi Arabia is they try to keep their business in, in-house. You know, it's almost like what happens in the royal family stays in the royal family. And all of the sudden, holy cow, we have Mohammed bin Salman, who's the youngest son of the king. Not only is he been named the heir apparent to the throne, but he is basically really showing his teeth and has arrested a number of other very senior ranking princes, including Al-Walid bin Talal, who is uh, estimated to be worth about $15 billion. Some people have called him the Warren Buffett of the Middle East. This guy is no schmuck. He's uh, a really serious guy, and there's actually reports that, that bin Salman has has, you know, tied these guys up and literally humiliated them with uh, beatings and all sorts of things. I don't know if any of, of those reports are actually true. Some of them are from dubious sources. But holy cow, what's going on in Saudi Arabia? And what's brought this about? And where's it headed? So what is going on in Agalam MBS? He's the real deal. I wrote an article, which is on my website from two years ago, that I stated that, look, in my book, I talked about the history of the Soviet Union. And you had that Ronald Reagan made the joke about how uh, he's having a hard time with the Soviets because they keep dying on him. Well, that's kind of in the chapter I had about the shaky house of Saud. I really broke it down going, well, that's exactly the trend that they were moving forward with. But if they were going to modernize themselves and, and adapt to the times, MBS is situated perfectly for this setup. So it, it, interestingly enough, the article I wrote two years ago didn't get much attention in the West, but boy, did it get a lot of attention from my colleagues in Saudi Arabia, in Dubai, in Kuwait, in Qatar. And what's going on today is not just within the royal family. The West is not really reporting much about how the Qataris had to pick up and walk away from their businesses, not just in Saudi Arabia, but also in Dubai. There's a lot going on that people are not talking about, and this is a very serious issue. Now, when Donald Trump's first trip to the Middle East, who did he meet with? Did he meet with the king or did he meet with the deputy crown prince, MBS? He met with MBS. That was a telltale signal. So I followed up with another article going, this is the real deal. The Americans have already aligned themselves with MBS. And if you're on the other side of this trade, be very careful. And this isn't just a, a purge for power. Think about right now, everyone's excited about the repatriation of U.S. companies' dollars coming back within to the U.S. market. Well, think about the tens of billions of dollars that the Saudi government is going to be able to seize or recontrol from all of the princes' offshore accounts, their trading accounts, their holdings. And this is a great way to fund maybe shortfalls rather than needing you know, $70 oil to balance their budget. Now they get another $100 billion within, if one individual has 15, what does 30 relatives within this, uh, the royal family own? So these are very wealthy people that have essentially lost all their power and do not think this is a, a grab for power. MBS is the real deal and he's thought this through and he has charted Saudi on a new course. And it's going to, you look what's going on in Yemen, Iran, Qatar, you know, there's going to be some really, really interesting changes moving forward in the Middle East. And you look at the housing prices in Dubai, there's a lot of uncertainty in the region right now. 
Speaking of uncertainty, you know, you, you take people who are billionaires and strip them of all of their wealth and lock them up. And in some cases, uh, they, they were given ultimatums, sounded like extortion. It was basically turn over your wealth to the state or, or else we're not going to let you go. We're going to you know, keep you locked up indefinitely. And some of them have done that. So as you say, it's very clear that Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, is making it very clear that he's the, the top dog in town. Uh, I can't believe he's making a lot of friends in the royal family doing this. So is there a potential backlash where there could be a coup, you know, to oust him? And what are the chances that, that maybe the instability just goes off the charts if, if there is a revolt by all these people that are, you know, were previously extremely powerful, extremely wealthy that have been stripped of that wealth? So I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. And when you spend time with, with the locals, you'll notice that it's a similar situation to what the West's perception of Putin is. The media in the West will magnify the anti-Putin crowd in Russia, but if you really spend enough time in Russia, the average Russian is quite proud of Putin because it's made them proud to be Russians again. And I know I'm going to get a lot of backlash for that, but I don't care. That's just the facts. Now, there's always a percentage that don't like him. But if you go and spend the time in, in Russia, and I'm not talking just about uneducated, what we would ca call redneck equivalents in Russia, drinking vodka, I'm talking about engineers, professionals, it's across the board. And the same can be said in, in the Middle East, there was a big resentment from the working people to the royal family. When I was in Kuwait, just before uh, the Arab Spring, it didn't dawn on me how frustrated the cab drivers and the workers were because of the extravagance of the royal family. And so from a local population, MBS is extremely popular for all of these moves. The citizens of Saudi are applauding him for this. He's popular for this. So now, so that's from the population standpoint. He's got them behind, especially grabbing this untold wealth and redistributing a percentage to the people He's being seen as like a Robin Hood. Secondly, within the royal family, there's always the potential of a coup, especially if the Americans change their support behind it. But right now, the American foreign policy is supporting M MBS. And until then, I think he's making all the right moves for his own strategy. Now, where do you think his strategy is headed? Because from what I understand, his Vision 2030 plan actually talks about diversifying away from a focus on oil as the national export and getting into tourism and various other things. It, it seems to me like Saudi Arabia's you know, natural resource wealth is, is all in oil. Am I missing something? Why is he thinking about these things? That's not quite true. For example, first of all, in the report I wrote about two years ago, I really stated how there is incredible wealth outside of oil in Saudi Arabia. You look at their copper deposits, their gold deposits, there's a lot of natural resource wealth in Saudi, but there's no doubt they're known for Guahar and you know their oil. Secondly, major transactions in green energy have been signed and completed and financed in the region. And we're talking about major companies, green energy companies, bidding on projects, and getting them, and we're not talking about small uh, 100 megawatts here and there, we're talking about thousands of megawatts. So, and that's billions of dollars of infrastructure coming in. So MBS has a longer term vision. He's playing the long game here. And, and I'm saying this is gonna happen, it's gonna be real. And there's no doubt he's gonna diversify. In the article two years ago, I suggested what I would do if I was his advisor. And it's really about developing not just the crude oil, depending on it, but you're gonna see them build up their own refinery complex because the way the oil market works, they could develop more non-gasoline products from their crude. You know, the, the petrochemical sector, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that Saudi Aramco can optimize. And that's where you're going to see the Chinese finance that aspect because the Russians and the success of the fracking are eating into their margins. So as the rest of OPEC cheat and fight for the scraps, you will see MBS develop his petrochemical sector, and that's going to be alongside with the green energy sector and further future industries. Those will be the, the, the big ones. Tourism and, and you know, th those types of things. Look, there's a lot of better places to go for tourism with your family than Saudi Arabia. But 
you know, th- those are good catch phrases, media phrases, but where it's going to be is the petrochemical complex and uh, the green energy sector and also the development of other resources. Now, help me reconcile what seems to me like a dichotomy, because on the one hand, you've described what MBS is doing is really needing to continue to have the United States back him up in terms of, you know, potentially uh, overcoming threats from the rest of the royal family that's uh, that's being ousted and so forth. He needs to keep that relationship going. I see a, a picture you have on your website of MBS shaking hands with President Trump taken earlier this year. But at the same time, I hear so much about this new yuan-denominated oil contract and how there may be a trend towards Saudi really doing a lot of things that could spell the death of the petrodollar system. That can't be a good thing for the United States. So does is he walking on a, a thin line there? Does he risk alienating the United States by continuing to pursue this agenda with China and Russia? See, great question. And I've written about this, stating specifically this question. And why I find it so fascinating is the best way to keep the American foreign policy paying attention is to make sure they know there is a equal competitor in China biting at the hip. And that's what's going to keep America honest and dedicated is knowing that there is an alternative to their support. Think about it in a way where Tito in the former Yugoslavia, he was playing the West versus the Soviets so well. And I think that's the strategy MBS is going to be moving for the next couple of decades. That's what I would do if I was him. And how do you see that playing out for the petrodollar? Because if this uh, yuan-denominated oil contract were to get traction and uh, compete with the Brent contract in a meaningful way, and I think that's a really, really big if, but if that were to happen, then potentially the U.S. ability to the, the whole regime of deficits don't matter because the U.S. has the exorbitant privilege of being able to issue so many dollars to meet the international demand. That starts to go away and it starts to undermine the ability of the U.S. to finance its government operations, certainly not overnight. Do you think we're headed in that direction? Is that you know a new trend that we're going to get to as a result of all this? So there's no doubt that eventually... Because of the success of fracking, you look how 20 years ago, no one ever thought America would become a major exporter of LNG, right? Everyone assumed America would become the world's largest importer of LNG. The same could be said for the success of the oil. No one 20 years ago pictured where America would be today. So with that fact, the dependence on foreign oil in America is decreasing significantly And there's many more options for the Americans than just the Saudis. So from an oil perspective, the Middle East has become much less important to the West, especially America, moving forward. For the Chinese, they get to play between the Russians and the Saudis as the largest importer of oil to China. And their refineries are set up to accept those types of crude. So moving forward, you'll see a slow transition. And remember, MBS is very smart and he's being advised by very smart individuals. And it's going to it's not going to happen where there will not be a situation where they close the petrodollar window the way Nixon closed the gold standard. I don't see that happening. It's going to be a gradual transition and everything's going to be very calculated. And, And in a way, I'm sure the American foreign policy will be consulted along the way. Now, the big news from last week, of course, was the OPEC cut extension for nine months through the end of 2018. And, you know, that was all the jump for joy. It's we've got complete agreement, Russia and Saudi Arabia totally on the same page. It's three or four days later, business days, as we're speaking on Wednesday morning, and already uh, Energy Secretary Novak from Russia is making public comments about how long it would take to pull out of that agreement if Russia wanted to. Did something change? What, What the heck is going on there? Okay, so that's a very important fact. Let's go back to early 2009 which was a similar state of chaos within OPEC, where the Russians were brought in as observers. Remember, the the Russians will never join OPEC because it's not in their interest to do so. They are an invited observer. Uh, Remember, any agreement they are not committed to. uh, That that people have to understand, regardless of what the media is reporting. So 
On that note, in early 2009, when the Saudis did cut back a lot of oil, the Russians kind of played coy and they increased their market share and increased their production. So the Russians will do what's best for the Russians. I enjoy observing the Russians because I think they're so much more sophisticated right now than the American foreign policy. And they've outplayed them on many, many, many platforms. But the reality here is, is even within OPEC, you look at the amount of cheating, the way the reporting is done. I think it's a well-known and accepted fact that even these commitments within OPEC really don't matter that much. And it really comes down to the Saudis leading the way and being the swing producer. And MBS knows that, hence why he's using this to his advantage to advance his agenda. Now, some commentators are saying that this whole nine-month extension, what it's really about is just holding up oil prices long enough for the Saudis to IPO Saudi Aramco, which was scheduled to occur in 2018. Then there was some talk about potentially, maybe for the sake of not having to report all their financials publicly, looking for a private placement with sovereign wealth funds. And it seems like they talked about that for long enough to send the message that they were interested in having those conversations. And I would guess that some of those conversations are occurring behind closed doors. And I'm very, very curious, particularly, I think, about the opportunity for China to make a strategic deal and a strategic investment in Saudi Aramco. If they did that quietly and it was not in a public placement, then all of a sudden it opens a lot of doors for China and Saudi Aramco to make a quiet deal, let's say, to sell oil to, to China that gets stored in Saudi Arabia, which means all the tanker tracker guys don't have the ability to figure out what's going on from the movement movements because some of these sales could be stored potentially domestically. And that's just one scenario. So what do you think is going on with the Aramco IPO or PPO, as the case may be? Is the extension and other policy matters, are they intended to facilitate the Aramco offering? And what happens after that deal, if it happens, has closed? Does that change the outlook for oil prices? So first thing, I've got a bunch of buddies that are heavily involved in uh, tracking not just containers but the flows of oil globally and they're very very sophisticated using real-time satellite information so even if they used unmarked containers there's ways to watch the flow from the ports um, so it'll be difficult but the smart guys will know how to track the flow of oil and estimate a range i think your assessment is correct. It's going to be an SEO from China, but I don't think you're going to see a IPO where Saudis are going to open their books, nor are they going to sell a percentage of their soil, their riches. Historically, that's something they did once. And then with the Saudi Aramco kicking out Chevron, that was something that they recognized control within. Where I do believe they'll do it is within the, the downstream aspect of the business, whether it's port facilities uh, refineries, that is the area I believe that would be the low-hanging fruit for the Saudis to be able to finance with outside money. That would be the first place you'll see the Chinese finance. So I don't think you'll see it as Saudi Aramco as one investment vehicle. You're going to see a multiple of perhaps limited partnerships within different aspects of the energy complex. And does that mean that the Aramco IPO still goes forward as an IPO, or does that fade away in favor of these other smaller deals? Well, there's, they're going to be very large deals, but you won't see an IPO of a trillion-dollar company. I think it'll be set up as IPOs, spinoffs of, say, a refinery sector in the east, the shipping facilities, the pipeline structures. Uh, that's what I see happening rather than one giant one massive trillion dollar IPO and everything under one umbrella. It's not in the best interest of the Saudis to do that. So if I can summarize, it sounds like you really see Mohammed bin Salman as being kind of the linchpin who really sees this big picture and knows how to play China against the United States. He can you know, get investment from China. That creates a little bit of threat to the petrodollar system, gives the United States a motive to continue to deal with him. You think he's playing everybody and being very successful at it. Is that a fair assessment of how you see this going down? Completely fair, and I, and I think you have to follow and appreciate that just because this is a young guy, that is all true, but he's one ambitious, brilliant young man. 
Okay, wow. Let's move on to another story that's related that it always just kind of gets my attention is so many people all around the world are just talking about, okay, look, electric cars are the future. It, it's where it's at, baby. Zero emissions. And they never seem to register that the electricity has to be generated someplace. And if that's coming from coal-fired electric plants, driving your Tesla actually produces more carbon emissions from the power plant than driving a high-efficiency diesel car does. At the same time, we don't have, if you talk about you know a few people buying Teslas, that's fine. If you talk about the massive, wide-scale adoption of electric vehicles technology that so many people are talking about as if it's a done deal, that would require a complete redesign or rebuild of our electrical generation and distribution grid capabilities, because we don't have the electric grid that could begin to support everybody having an electric vehicle. So I know you are very bullish on electric vehicles. How does this play out, not just in terms of the development of the the battery technology for the cars, which is what everybody seems to focus on, but does it mean that nuclear energy is going to make a comeback? How do we get more electricity to run all these things? And how do we get the electrical grid distribution capacity that doesn't exist today in order to facilitate that? Okay, so let's break down from the regions the West, the developed world, America, let's focus on that, has about, I don't know, I guess it's around somewhere between 750 uh, to 800 uh, cars per every thousand people on the road. Let's step away from talking about the West right now, and let's go to China, where they have less than 100 cars per every thousand. And let's now go to somewhere like India, I remember I spent a lot of time with the uh, energy minister in India, and we spent a lot of time talking about this. They have less than 20 cars per thousand on the roads. But let's look at their infrastructure as is. It is very poor infrastructure as is, and the government now is realizing that they can bypass the whole combustion engine the way a lot of India, Africa, and China has bypassed the wired communication. So for example, they, they didn't have to do the telephones the traditional way. They just adopted the cell phone, the rapid adoption of the cell phone. So if you take a look at what is going on in China, they are investing hundreds of billions of dollars into exactly this. And more importantly, they are mandating these changes. So if you want to be an SEO or funded and loaned to take debt money from the government, if you're a car company, you have to have so many focus. So now everyone, you're right, everyone's focusing on these batteries and how they're going to make them better and whether it's going to be solid state, lithium, cobalt, so many problems with it because there's just not enough cobalt to meet the demand. But who says that the winner of all this has to be a battery? And I've written about this, that you own. What if it's like a propane gas tank where... You own the car, but whichever Tesla or the future cars, if we go to India, let's say it's Tata Motors in China or any of the, the vehicles, and you pull up to the, the electric station and, and it's like just replaces the battery and it takes about a long time to fill up your gas, let's say less than three, four minutes, and you're off with a new battery that's charged. Why do we need to figure out a grid? It's going to be a very different grid than what everyone's applying to today. That type of scenario is going to be much easier to adopt in India, in China, in the developing parts of the world than it would be, let's say, downtown New York or you know, downtown Toronto or L.A., where you already have an infrastructure complex. Now, let's go back to what will happen in the West. To take this massive adoption, it's going to be almost going back to what you know the original battle between Tesla and Edison, alternating current versus direct current in Everyone knows that Tesla was proven right, but now it's almost going to go back to that, wait a second, for the success of the electric vehicles in many parts of the world, we're going to go back to Edison's strategy of the source of power where it it gets charged up. So power stations within the city where, for example, you're going to have driverless vehicles. Things are going to be optimized that when you park your car or get dropped off from your, your work, who says that it can't go and get the, uh, the batteries at some station within the city? So we don't know what the exact solution is going to be. And I don't try to pretend I, I've written about all the different possible battery combinations that everyone's working on. And then I say, 
it's kind of like we're still at the Palm Pilot. The BlackBerry's just coming in, and the iPhone wasn't even invented yet. So we're like in 2004 in the, the phone revolution here. Let's give it another 10 years, and you know it's going to be an adoption that's going to be much faster on a, on a percentage adoption in the developing world in India. And, and remember, it's going to be a different type of vehicles where in India – you're not going to have a SUV type of vehicle. You know, when you go to uh, New Delhi, for example, all of the cars are mandated to be CNG, which is compressed natural gas. Uh, they don't burn gasoline in their cities, and they still have huge pollution issues. And over 45% of the power is coal, as you mentioned. So the governments there have a lot more power to mandate change than they do in the West because the infrastructure is completely government dependent. So you look at Mumbai and, and all of the infrastructure that is required, it's going to be set up. Uh, India's putting over $50 billion just into their uh, airports. And it's, it's a gong show. When I was down in uh, Mumbai, it was a brand new airport, but it's still not big enough to handle all of the chaos in India. Uh, everyone's tripping over one another. You go to China, same thing. So this is a very real term evolution, but it's going to happen. And that's where the cars are moving forward. And more importantly, if you're a Volkswagen in the West, say, you look at what are some of the biggest costs for these vehicles. You know, a combustion engine vehicle has over 2,000 moving parts, where an electric vehicle has less than 200. And that's a lot simpler to replace. And you look at an electric vehicle, you know, if you compare a gas to an engine to a diesel, a diesel is about twice as long life standing. Electric vehicle was about three to four times what a diesel is. So there's a lot more efficiencies for someone like Volkswagen, who's broken the law and is going to be fined significantly, where they can now get rid of the unions or reduce the dependence on the unions for labor and all these different aspects. So I really do believe that the electric vehicle revolution is real. The adoption rates are going to be much faster in the developing world because there's so much more low hanging fruit and they can develop their infrastructure in line with the adoption of the electric vehicle, whereas they didn't pre-design it to the combustion engine, if that makes sense. Now, you've been recognized by a lot of people as an authority on uranium investing and understanding nuclear energy very well. It seems to me like, on the one hand, if we're going to have this electric vehicle revolution, we really need more electric generation capability. And it brings this question of, will there be a revival or a renaissance of nuclear energy? But at the same time, post Fukushima, boy, the public sentiment against nuclear energy, I'm not sure it's ever been stronger. How do you see this working out? Are we going to have a nuclear renaissance? Is it going to play a major role in energy generation in the future? Well, it's played a major energy role, let's take for in the U.S. It's still 18 to 20 percent of baseload power post Fukushima, right? The Achilles heel of the nuclear sector, the uranium renaissance, is the fact that the current designs of these reactors are just too expensive. It's too big of an upfront cost for anyone to put on their balance sheet. The price of uranium is irrelevant to the cost of nuclear electricity. It really is, by the time you permit these things, and an $8 billion uh, reactor complex ends up becoming twice as long and you know, somewhere between 15 and $18 billion, where companies like Westinghouse have gone down because of these cost overruns. Toshiba's had to get government help because of these cost overruns. These are big, big cost overruns. So. I guess the answer to your question is, I also believe the future of nuclear will have to change where the upfront costs are smaller. So whether it's a you know, pebble bed reactors or smaller modules, I think rather than two, 3,000 megawatt projects, will we ever see a scenario where it's a 250 megawatt nuclear reactor and the costs aren't just one-tenth of that, they're one-fiftieth of that? Uh, I think that's where it'll go. That's where it'll have to go. In China, it's a bit of a different story than the cost overruns in the West, uh, because again, it's the government backing it. So there, you know, you look at a place like India that has less than two percent of their baseload power from nuclear. They want to get to where America is is twenty percent. Same as China, they're less than five percent today. They want to get to twenty five percent, and they've planned and financed seventy reactors to come online. So uranium and nuclear energy. It's not going to disappear, but you know you have a lot of stockpiles built up. There's about four or five years of above-ground stockpile 
So for the price of uranium to get going, you're probably going to have to see 20 to 25. To get the price of uranium to double, you'll have to see 25 reactors come online globally. And the key question here is, what will the Americans do with their nuclear warheads? See, what the USSR in, the, in 1992, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, they downblended their nuclear warheads to make nuclear energy. That was an agreement signed here in Vancouver, Canada between the Americans and the Russians. Now there's not a chance Putin, and you know, in my book I said there's not a chance he's gonna ever redo that type of contract because it made no sense for the Russians at the time. Under Boris Yeltsin, they were bankrupt and they, they needed what they could get. But I ask you, will the Americans downblend their nuclear warheads to create nuclear power? I say no. Secondly, the infrastructure is not in place in America you would, would take about $20 billion of infrastructure to be able to create a complex to do so. But if the Americans did say, hey, let's downblend 10% of our nuclear warheads to create some HEU to LEU, they would have to send their nuclear reactors to Russia to get that done. I just don't see that scenario. Yeah, I think the scenario of U.S. nuclear warheads being sent to Russia to be disassembled and downblended is is very, very unlikely. Uh, I want to make sure we, we make a point, though, that you alluded to there. I, I read about it and was fascinated on your website in one of your articles. You know, most Americans would naturally assume, I think a lot of our listeners understand, that uranium, as it comes out of a uranium mine, is not particularly useful to anybody. You can't make nuclear power plants or nuclear weapons with it. It has to be enriched first. And it's really the enrichment process or the capability to enrich yellow cake uranium, the stuff that comes out of the mine, and turn it into the stuff that you can make a nuclear reactor or a nuclear weapon from. Now, most Americans, I think, would assume, obviously, that's a, a national security thing. we got to have that locked up. The ability to do all of that enrichment must be primarily concentrated in the United States, in national laboratories, under lock and key, because it's a, such a, an important security issue. That's not the story, though, is it? No, it's, it's a kind of interesting. What would be the media response in the West if 90% of the coal or oil or natural gas that America consumed came from Russia or Russian-controlled sources? There would be chaos. There would be protests. There would be... But for whatever reason, because people just don't like, I call it the Jane Fonda effect of the China syndrome, the movie, there's just this negative vibe about nuclear energy. And here's the fact. More people have died from coal mines and more people have had a disease from electricity generated from coal plants than the whole nuclear industry globally. If you look at from a production standpoint, Americans have been incredibly innovative going from you know something called ISR in situ recovery to what I call wiser, where it's warm ISR in Texas. And yet today, America imports about 95 percent of the uranium. It, it consumes between 50 to 55 million pounds a year. And you're looking, it imports, it produced less than 2 million pounds last year. And this year, it'll be less than 2 million pounds also. So where are they making up the difference? The DOE is doubling up their sales, and the rest is coming from the Kazakhs and the Russians. Even though America has all these sanctions on Russia, yes, we're still getting 25% of the imports from the Russians. It's one of the you know side notes to the sanctions. Now, when you go to Kazakhstan, what is the language that all of the government reports are done? It's Russian Cyrillic. Who controls the projects? It, you know, let's just face it, this was drilled all during the Russian times, and it's the Russians are there. They control it. Again, it's about the enrichment. The Russians control a little over half of the global enrichment capacity of uranium. And I eventually see an area where, you know, like how oil is priced in different, you know, you got your Saudi, you got your Brent crude, you have your WTI. That's where we're going with uranium. And it is insane to me that the DOE is selling uranium on their stockpiles, first of all, at a much lower cost base than what they paid for it. Number two, at a price much lower than any U.S. mine can make the same uranium at. So it's just a real bastardized program. And here's the real reason. In the early 1960s, America was the world's largest uranium producer and consumer. It produced over 35 million pounds. You go to 2015, it produced around 3.5 million pounds. 
And since then, it's about half of that. Why? Because they were getting a lot of cheap uranium from the Russians. They got addicted to it. And interestingly enough, the whole uranium sector in the U.S. employs less than a thousand people. So from a lobbyist standpoint, it's irrelevant. But yet it one in every five homes in America is powered by nuclear power. So there's, there's a lot of facts. And one in every 10 homes in America is powered by Soviet-powered uh, uranium. Uh, this may not be an, an issue for most Americans, but you better believe it's an issue for Putin. And he's strategizing on this, and he's playing the long game on it. Okay, but we're still in the United States. 20% of electrical generation is dependent on nuclear power. We don't have enough coal-fired plants to make up for that if those things got turned off somehow. Now, if I understand what you're telling me, the ability to enrich uranium, we've got a pretty good stockpile of it. We, we could take our nuclear weapons apart and downblend them. But the ability to enrich uranium from a uranium mine and turn it into fuel for a reactor, if there was a breakdown between the East and the West where Kazakhstan and Russia just stopped dealing with us and didn't want to sell us anything, they've got all of the enrichment capability and we've got almost none is that right and is, is that something that's simple just write a check and and uh you know build a few new enrichment facilities or is it harder to do than that oh it's very hard so in 2007 they were trying to finance and build it but again the difference between the russian and the chinese infrastructure is it's government like the the enrichment facilities that were built that was during a communist era whereas the in the u.s it was a private enterprise trying to develop it so if you go Converdine and Illinois, you know, it's got a little bit of capacity. But again, at these prices, you know, they've pulled back. If a true breakdown happened between the East and the West, uh, it wouldn't shut down overnight. But you would see the price of uranium triple or quadruple because they would drastically have to replace 50 million pounds of imports from friendlier sources. Well, the first place you would look is domestically. There is a lot of uranium in America. Texas is some of the lowest cost in the world with the, I call it wiser uranium, warm ISR, and there's permitted built infrastructure there. But again, you're looking at maybe 5 million pounds can come online within six months to replace 50 million. You would have to go to the Canadians, uh, Cameco, and really prop up the prices. They just shut down the world's largest uranium mine called MacArthur River. And that was one of the lowest cost producers in the world because it can't make money at $23 uranium, so they just shut it down. That's the equivalent of Russia or Saudi Arabia shutting down all of their oil production globally, where one mine, MacArthur River in the Athabasca Basin, produced 10, a little, about 12% of the global primary uranium production. So, But interestingly enough, Cameco has signed off a lot of these agreements to the Indians the Australians, with their uranium production, have signed off with a lot of the uh, Chinese companies needing it. So America's kind of left it, it, it in a flux. It, it would really have to rely on the DOE to make up the back difference. And the DOE has never released how much uranium it has in stockpiles. And I've calculated, and, and it can't be more than four or five years at this point because how much they've sold under the Obama administration. So it, there's going to be a predicament coming very soon. Speaking of the relations with Russia, I think that's a topic that's on a lot of people's minds. Now, you've been quite expert on the subject of Vladimir Putin and you know what he's up to in Russia. You wrote a New York Times bestseller back in 2013 called The Colder War, and it was about Vladimir Putin's strategy and why you felt that there were a lot of risks to the United States in terms of energy policy with Russia controlling more and more things. Now, that was written before the big 2014-2015 oil price correction. So can you give us an update? You know, Vladimir Putin just this morning, I think, announced officially that he's running for re-election in Russia. No great surprise there. Is he likely to remain in charge of Russia for the foreseeable future? And what do people need to understand about Vladimir Putin and about Russia as we move forward in this uh, new era where it seems like, you know, Russia and China are getting more and more important in the world as time marches on? You just nailed it on the head. And you would not believe how uh, much negative attention the book brought me in the West. 
media outlets would ask me, but Vladimir Putin's just a thug and he's a buffoon. I went, there's nothing further from the truth. This guy is a brilliant, experienced, calculating, he's, he's a political chess master, and he has shown time in and time out that the Russians are playing the long game here. They've lined themselves up with their allies, whereas and really backed them and supported their allies where, you know, can the same be said about the Americans? The American allies, go ask the Kurds in Kurdistan what they think of the American allies, how they've been dumped a couple of times in the, in the Middle East. So in Russia, when you go, the average Russian, Putin will go down in history as a true leader of someone that revitalized national spirit and stood up to the West. That's a big theme. Most in Russia do not see America as the land of the free. They see America as the dark side, the capitalist side. But within Russia, whether Putin runs or not, he has a firm grasp on power behind the scenes. A, a good sign in the Russian mentality is a major oil deal is not a major oil deal unless Putin shows up for the signing to witness it and it's always televised. That's how you know a deal is real in Russia. So do not count out the Russians. And more importantly, look at the legway they've made within China, the emerging markets, the one Silk Road. And unfortunately, you know, the Americans are now being exposed under the Mueller investigation as very vulnerable in many ways. And, you know, there, there is this misconception, in my opinion, that Trump and Putin were somehow conspiring together to win the election. I think the Russians were so ahead that they've got the dirt on both Democrats and the Republicans, and it would be irrelevant who's in power, that the Russians are really manipulating the American situation, and they're in control, not the Americans. Wow. Sobering message. As we close, please tell our listeners what they can expect to find at katusaresearch.com, what business you're in, what uh, services you offer. And you've got a fantastic wealth of information on your website. So give us a, a quick rundown of what people can expect to find there. Yeah, I've been publishing my thoughts for over 15 years. It's, uh, and, and I publish everything is on the website, whether you want to learn on how to successfully speculate in resources or how to finance development, whether it's a mine or a green energy project. And it's what I love to do. It's treated me very well. And that's kind of, just go to katusaresearch.com and there's a wealth of information there at your fingertips for free. Fantastic. I cannot thank you enough, Marin, for an excellent interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. You know, Eric, I have to say that was a great interview with Marin Katusa. Uh, now, we have many guests that come on to the show and we hear all these alternate opinions about often the same topics. So it was really interesting uh, to gain so many insights on the Middle East and Russia, normally things we don't get from our guests. What stood out for you? You know, Marin is always a, a good source for a different view. He, he's always thinking about things that other people aren't thinking about. And one of the things I found most fascinating, it was more from reading his website. He didn't say that much about it in this interview. It, ju it blows my mind, Patrick, that so many people in the United States are just preoccupied with this Russophobia of, you know, did Russia supposedly influence an election by buying an ad on Facebook or whatever the allegation is? I, I think it's so silly, I've lost track of it. Meanwhile, when you talk about the capability to enrich uranium that's needed for both nuclear power and nuclear weapons, uh, I only learned from reading Marin's blog that more than 50% of the worldwide capacity for uranium enrichment 
is either in Russia or it's in places like Kazakhstan, which are, are effectively controlled by Russia, you know, former Soviet states. The United States doesn't have the uranium enrichment capability to enrich its own uranium if uh, ties with Russia were ever broken down. And that's not something that the Russians have done, you know, surreptitiously. That is just the United States not planning its affairs very well. We are dependent on Russia for contracting them to either buy their uh, their former weapons uranium and downblend it to be uh, you know a nuclear power plant grade or if we run out of that or they don't want to sell it to us we have to hire them in order to enrich uranium uh, from yellow cake which can be mined into something that can be used for power plants I mean how, what has allowed the United States to get itself into that circumstance relative to Russia with something as strategically as important as uranium enrichment capability. It blows my mind. All right. Well, Eric, let's move on now. We we're going to talk about Bitcoins, but I just wanted to go back and touch on the short vol trade because we had two great post-game sessions, one with Kevin Muir coming on the show, and then we followed it up with uh, Devin Anderson. And we just had just amazing insights on uh, this short vol trade and how it all can unwind. And what I found interesting was Devin tried to be very rational and said, well, look, it would take a pretty big move in the markets to really put stress on this VIX complex. And he was uh, touting, you know, that four or five percent would be a pretty big stress point, and then seven percent there would be a real big issue. So I went back on the charts and I looked. Well, when was the last time that we saw a seven percent drop in the market? So you know, Eric, I'm going to ask you as a quiz. When do you think was the last time we saw a seven percent drop? There's going to be a quiz. You didn't tell me there was going to be a quiz. The um, seven percent drop on S and P 500, definitely the flash crash, and I would guess after that. The 2015, what was it, August, September, something like that, there was an, an, an event then that might have been that big. I'm not sure. Exactly, Eric. So, well, you know, a lot of people think, well, uh, a 5 7% move, oh, we have to go back to 1987 or we have to go back to 2008. Well, in the post-Great Financial Crisis period, the last 10 years, we've had three of those drops. We had, during the flash crash in 2010, we had a 10% drop in the markets in 30 minutes. And then you turn around and you look, 2011, we had a big drop. And then in 2015, just two years ago, we had a drop of just over 7% in the last phase. Like in the, During that little crash in August of 2015, we went from about the 2080 level down to about 1840 in three days. It was about a 12% drop, but it was in the last day, the S&P went from about 1980 down to about 1840, about a 7% drop in one day. So this is not out of the realm of possibility for us to see one of these. I mean, it's not going to happen year in, year out, but one of these events is not out of the norm. Well, let's just take a step back here because I think Devin was really trying to make a point and I want to credit him for it because I learned something from that interview that I certainly didn't know before. And the point he was making is a lot of people have gotten really wound up about the risk in the VIX complex and think about, oh my gosh, what if the VIX doubled or tripled over the course of two or three weeks? And Devin explained, and I think it was a very credible explanation, that a lot of people could lose a lot of money. The target manager that turned his half a million bucks into 13 million bucks would probably lose his 13 million bucks if that happened. But it doesn't really present any systemic risk if it happens over a period of several days. The point that Devin was really stressing, and I think it's important to acknowledge and credit him for having taught us something that I didn't understand previously, is it doesn't really matter that much in terms of systemic risk, ha what happens over several days. What's really important is what could happen in the course of just one day. If you want to hear the explanation, go back to last week's show when Devin explained it. It goes to the mechanics of these instruments. And as you're saying, the thing is that, that blew my mind. I understand why he wanted to make that point because so many people are maybe thinking that there's a bigger risk than there really is for an event that could happen over the course of five or six or seven trading days. The thing is, 7% in one trading day definitely happened at the flash crash. As you said, it happened in the 2015 event. It's not unheard of. And if, if you want to know what could do it right now, all it would take is if North Korea launches a missile, let's say their intention is just to prove they have the range that they could have hit Hawaii if they wanted to. So they splash the missile down 
down in the middle of the ocean, a thousand miles south of Hawaii. If that got misreported the way ABC misreported the Donald Trump story last week, and they said that a missile was launched at Hawaii, that would bring you more than a 7% down in 10 minutes. And from what I understand, that could create this fire that nobody can put out, where VIX futures just go basically no offer, and you know XIV has to liquidate. They have to buy these things. He described a mechanism that if there was a crisis in the VIX futures contract, but it was not there in the underlying actual VIX index, that there is a way for institutions to arbitrage that difference through another type of institutional instrument. Well, the thing that comes to my mind is on a day when you've got a 7% plus move, are institutions going to be arbing that spread out of existence, or are they going to have their hands full with other stuff? And it depends on what caused the 7% move. If it was a story about an incorrect fake news story about North Korea launching a missile at Hawaii, I bet they'd be busy with other things. So it just says to me that what could happen in one day, although, yeah, it is a an unlikely scenario. It's not at all unheard of. It's going to happen someday. And when it does, what I really worry about, Patrick, the the fact that the target manager who made his 13 million bucks could lose it again, he knows he's taking that risk, or maybe he doesn't know he's taking that risk. He ought to know he's taking that risk. What I worry about is when I hear about all these pension funds that are in this trade that are short VIX futures. I don't know what kind of size they're short, but let's suppose that doomsday scenario happens where VIX futures more than double in the course of a half an hour because there was some kind of event in the market, and then they go to no offer because because basically, let's say the XIV starts liquidating, they have to buy more futures in order to cover their shorts than there is available liquidity in the market. And it just goes to a no offer condition where the, the market is just wacko. What happens to pension funds at that point? And is there a risk where a large number of pension funds could lose 20 or 30 or 40 percent of their net equity if all of a sudden VIX futures went from 11 to 50? Maybe the VIX didn't go to 50, but the VIX futures did. Does that potentially blow up pension funds to the point where it creates a systemic risk for the retirement future of you know a significant part of the country? I am not saying it does. I don't know the answer to that question. But after processing what Devin told us last week, that's really the question in my mind. It's not... Can it happen? Because I know a 7% or a 10%, or in the case of 1987, which is admittedly is a very unusual circumstance, uh, a 22 plus percent in one day move could happen. My question is, if it does happen, what does that mean? If the VIX actually went to 50 in a day and some crazy event, does it blow up pension funds in a way where they basically get whipsawed out of those short vol positions at a crazy loss that takes them years to recoup? I don't know. I have no idea. I'd love to have an expert on the program who can speak authoritatively to that. Well, you know, one thing that I, I would mention is, is that one of the tenants we see is as we go forward in the markets and we see these markets making higher highs, all of these money managers essentially have no choice but to be reluctantly long. It's just the way you even you talk about the markets and you just have to go with it because it's just going up and you have to be participating. You have career risk as a manager not being in the market. But when you are a reluctant long where you have to be in the market because it's going up, you don't really want to be long. So I wonder how many people in this market are long but don't want to be long. And as soon as we, their choppy waters appears, do they all believe that there will be the liquidity to get out of the market if they all try to get it at the same time? You know, that's where the liquidity crisis really can emerge itself. Well, and it's a super, super important point that you bring up that investors have to understand, which is, and this came up in 2000 at a lot of professional finance conferences. There were people who were money managers saying, it is insane to stay in this market. It doesn't make sense. They totally went to cash in their personal accounts. They don't want to be invested, but they know the rules of the game in professional finance are... If you don't stay invested and you miss the last 10% of upside, you have underperformed relative to the rest of the industry. It is a career-ending move. On the other hand, if you stay invested in what you know is a bubble and wait for it to blow up so that you lose half of your investors' money or two-thirds of your investors' money, 
as long as everybody else blew up at the same time, it doesn't create career risk because you just say, hey, nobody saw it coming. Oh my gosh, 2008. A lot of people did see it coming and they couldn't get out because the pressure that's put on professional money managers is to stay long in order not to underperform a benchmark. And the fact that they know it's going to blow up someday doesn't keep them out of the market. And I think the more that we can educate investors to understand that pressure that exists on professionals, the better. All right, Eric. So listen, all of our listeners are waiting for us to talk Bitcoin. So let's get right to it. Now, you know, I want to start off with Zero Hedge has this big headline running, which is basically Bitcoin berserker run resumes. And one of the interesting things that they pointed out there is how long it's taking this cryptocurrency to cross key psychological levels. So they make the point that going from zero to 1000 took 1789 days going from 2000 to 3000 took, you know, 23 days. And then it goes from 6,000 to 7,000 took 13 days, you know, to go from 10,000 to 11,000 took one day. Then, it, you know, go from 14,000 to 15,000 took 10 hours from 16,000 to 17,000, two hours. And then from 18,000 to 19,000, three minutes. Like what we're seeing is like this parabolic crazy run on the upside of Bitcoin. And everyone is just like the amount of text messages I've been getting from members and family and everything about, well, should I buy Bitcoin? What's going on with Bitcoin? It's just amazing, just the euphoria that's going on right now. Well, the thing that's so important that we stress, nothing has changed in the fundamentals for Bitcoin overnight. Actually, if something changed, there was an exchange, crypto mining exchange that was hacked and about $62 million worth of Bitcoin was stolen, which just proves that even though the Bitcoin protocol itself is very secure, if you're going to have your Bitcoin on deposit at an exchange and there's malfeasance on the part of that exchange, or for that matter, it doesn't have to be malfeasance. It could be outright theft. All your Bitcoin can get stolen. And that's what happened to at least one exchange. That, that should have been cause for concern. What we're seeing here is on no positive change in fundamentals. The price is accelerating dramatically to the upside and people for no other reason than because the price is accelerating are just going into a mania. And what blows my mind, the interactions on Twitter today, so many people were in my face because I've been a skeptic of Bitcoin. And the essence of what I think their point was, was, ha ha, you stupid idiot. Look at the price now. You were wrong when you said it's in a bubble. And it's like, dude, when the price goes up $1,000 in three minutes on no change in fundamentals, that's not disproving my opinion that the price is in a bubble. It's proving it in spades. And, you know, I, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying that it's time to short this. I would not dare to short Bitcoin. It's quite possible that it could double again from here or quadruple again. And I think if I wanted to summarize, Saxo Bank does this thing every year they call outrageous predictions. I thought they so perfectly nailed it because it's very much in line with what I've said before. They've said they think Bitcoin is going to sixty six zero thousand dollars in 2018 as this mania continues. After that, they think that there's a concerted effort by governments around the world to outlaw it, and it closes 2018 below $1,000 after it has basically collapsed in value after having been outlawed. I think they've got it exactly right. Now, to be clear, the idea that this has to happen by the end of 2018 or that the number has to be $60,000, they're guessing too. It could be $30,000. It could be $120,000. I don't know what the number is. But what's going to happen is we're going to see craziness continue. This mania, and that's what it is, is a mania, is going to continue to inflate the value of this asset, which has no intrinsic value. It is less valuable than fiat currency. Fiat currency is defined as currency that has no intrinsic value because it not, cannot be exchanged or redeemed for anything, but it gets its value solely from the government blessing it and saying it has value. Bitcoin is just like fiat currency, except it doesn't have that government blessing. And I predict that it's likely going to be outlawed by governments before too much longer. But what's happening is this mania takes the price higher, it could take it much higher still. 
eventually it can't end well. And, you know, there is no intrinsic value in this. The fact that it can be transacted across the internet and internationally and so forth, these are wonderful innovations. They will continue to exist for a long time. But you can invent a new cryptocurrency that does all of those things, and you could very easily do a better job with what's known now because Bitcoin has a lot of inefficiencies. Closing a transaction, you know, there's a limit to how many transactions can occur. It's not scalable. You, you can design a much better, more scalable currency, and I think they will, and they'll be government-backed, and they will not have these libertarian features that prevent governments from being able to trace them and track them. It'll be the exact opposite. So I think that the cryptocurrency of the future is not the Bitcoin. It's the Orwell, and I call it that for the obvious reason, that it's going to have the exact opposite characteristics. I think Bitcoin is going to be be labeled as a tool of uh, black marketeers and terrorists. And to some extent, that's true. I mean, it is being used by criminals because if you want to ransom somebody and you don't want to get caught picking up the money, which is when they usually catch you in, in, a, in a ransom deal, you can do it with Bitcoin. There was a, a guy in Germany, I think, this week who, I don't even remember the, the story, it was some kind of bomb plot, and you know, they had to pay in Bitcoin, which they did in order to get them to not set off a bomb or something. Those kinds of things are going to give governments all the fuel that they need to outlaw this thing. Until then, I don't know if it keeps going up. This is crazy, but manias can continue. And what blows my mind is how strong the sentiment is. The Bitcoin advocates will cite the price action on no change in fundamentals radically to the upside as evidence that there is no bubble. And that just blows my mind. You know, Eric, I'm going to stick my neck out here and at the risk of having egg all over my face. But, you know, I really can't help but to feel that that this is all going to come to an end quickly here because, well, I'm not going to make a prediction on the final price. But the one thing when you study bubbles through history and when they get into this final parabolic phase, while the price level is not always transparent, what will be the final price that it prints, the one thing we have a pretty good gauge on is time because gravity at some point is going to take over. You can't just have it going up a thousand points in three minutes and it just gets to this parabolic phase without at some point it, it, it uh, hitting its head. So I, I actually think that we're going to see short to intermediate high on Bitcoin this year. We'll see whether or not I'm right. But what's interesting is, is that we literally in the, over the next couple of weeks have the release of Bitcoin futures. And Kevin Muir put out a blog on that. And one of his friends was asking him the question is that when it trades, uh, will it sell at a premium or a discount to fair value? you, you know, how will it trade? And, you know, he responds by saying it will trade like garbage. Whether he's right or not, we'll find out. What's interesting is, is that will the, the futures maybe be the catalyst that could, could bring in that short term high and create the turn point? We'll see. Well, and, you know, there's been a huge amount of disparity. Even today at one point, Zero Hedge was reporting $2,000 differences between exchanges on where Bitcoin was being quoted. And that obviously opens the question of, is there a way for somebody to arbitrage that spread with some kind of algorithmic trading system that, you know, goes in and buys and sells on different exchanges at different prices? The futures contract is going to introduce more opportunity for that to happen because the technology to trade futures contract algorithmically is very well known and well developed. So there's definitely uh, an aspect to it there. Will it trade at a premium or a discount? Account. I suspect that the presence of the futures will probably reduce this crazy volatility to some extent because the futures can transact more efficiently than these exchanges can. But at the same time, what I just noticed today is they have, at least on one of these contracts, I think it was the CBOE contract that I was looking at, it has dramatically reduced trading hours. In other words, most futures contracts trade about 23 hours a day, and they're trading like only six hours a day on one of these Bitcoin contracts. So I don't know what that's about, but I, you know, I certainly would not want to, as a futures trader, I would want nothing to do with trading in a futures contract where the underlying instrument is trading independently and the futures market is closed, which means I can't get out of my position if the underlying starts to move against me in the cash market. So I don't know how professional futures traders are going to react to these contracts if they have, you know, characteristics and conditions like that. Well, Eric, is there anything else that you can think of to put a wrap onto our Bitcoin conversation? 
Well, just that the misinformation in the market is insane. You know, there's one guy that was on CNBC that's actually telling people that Bitcoin's going to a million dollars. And the reason is because there's a likely currency failure coming in Venezuela. And he he thinks that the people of Venezuela, the masses, as he put it, are all going to turn to Bitcoin instead of local currency. And that's going to push it through the roof. This is just so ridiculous, Patrick. First of all, I I have a friend who's Venezuelan and has family there and tells me stories of things that go on. There are people, you know, professionals, college professors, people with advanced degrees in Venezuela who are literally turning to prostitution for food. And I don't mean make a few hundred dollars so they have food money for next month. I mean trade sex with a stranger for enough food to feed themselves and their children for that one night only. That's how bad things are in Venezuela. Nobody has any money. So this idea that the masses in Venezuela are going to take their spare money and put it in Bitcoin. First of all, they don't have any spare money. And second of all, if they did, what's the mechanism to get it onto a Bitcoin exchange? How are they going to get through the Venezuelan banking system and be able to transfer money into these exchanges? It's, it's just ridiculous. The misinformation that is being presented to the public Uh, supposedly from experts. These people are not experts. They have no clue what they're talking about. And I think the misinformation that exists is just scary here. Anyway, on that note, we do have to wrap it there in the interest of time. Folks, we really need your help promoting the program. The more registered users we have at macrovoices.com, the more able Patrick is to recruit the very best feature interview guests. The benefit to you for registration is you'll receive our free research roundup email never contains any advertising or marketing. It's just a compendium of links to all the coolest stuff that we could find on the internet, including downloads from our feature interviews. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. Well, first of all, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview with Marin. As well, uh, there was an interesting blog article to complement what we were talking about called The Crowded Short Vol Trade. Also, I referenced that uh, blog article from Kevin Muir talking about another embarrassing prediction about Bitcoin futures. And there's also a download link to the semi-annual Bank of Canada Financial System Review, which is something I always enjoy reading kind of to get a perspective on uh, what's going on in Canada. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup so that does it for this week's episode we appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better now for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners uh, send us an email at research roundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. Now, if you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices, for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.